Um, we're, um, we're very privileged to have with us this evening a very recognizable figure in the media and, and business world. Steve Forbes is, of course, editor-in-chief of, of Forbes magazine, the nation's leading uh, business magazine, and he has headed a media company that includes not only Asian and European editions, but a number of web properties focused on politics, sports, and financial markets. Many of you will uh, also remember uh, Steve's spirited campaigns for the Republican presidential nomination in 1996 and 2000, during which he promoted the idea of, among other things, a flat tax, uh, along with the new Social Security system, medical savings account, term limits, and a strong national defense. This evening, Steve's, Steve comes to us as an author, which also is not a new role for him. He's written or co-written five previous books. His sixth and latest one, Money, How the Destruction of the Dollar Threatens the Global Economy and What We Can Do About It, is every bit as emphatic, reasoned, and clearly written as the earlier works. Anyone familiar uh, with uh, his free market libertarian views will not, not be surprised to read his criticisms of central banks and existing monetary policies. With the Fed now winding down its quantitative easing, uh, Steve sees an especially opportune moment to rethink our monet monetary system and ensure a more sound and stable currency by returning to the gold standard. He writes in the book, quote, freeing the dollars from gold was supposed to make the United States stronger. Instead, it has made the country weaker. Something has to be done. Ladies and gentlemen, here to explain what needs to be done, along with Steve's co-author, Elizabeth Ames, who is a communications executive, is Steve Forbes. Well, thank you very much, Brad, and thank all of you for coming out. As uh, Brad indicated, uh, the book is about money, monetary policy. And money, and particularly monetary policy, is one of those topics that seems to intimidate a lot of people for some strange reason. And as a result, uh, the Federal Reserve, for example, has less formal oversight from Capitol Hill, from Congress, than do our intelligence agencies. And the thesis of this book is that, one, the topic of money is very straightforward and simple. Even though it's shrouded in a lot of jargon, a lot of equations, uh, the, the, uh, the idea of money is very basic. We've gotten away from it. And our policymakers today know less about money, monetary policy, than they did 100 years ago. And since the early 1970s, even though we've had booming decades in the 80s and 90s, overall, our growth rates since we went off the Bretton Woods system, the old gold standard, in 1971, the U.S. average growth rates are less than they were before 1971. And if we'd maintained the growth rates that we had for 180 years up to 1971, if we'd maintained those growth rates after 1971, on average, the U.S. economy today would be 50 percent larger than it is now. Forty years compounding, in effect reverse compounding, adds up to a lot. Just savor for a moment having 50 percent higher incomes, what it would mean for the deficit, what it would mean for Social Security, what it would mean for a lot of the social divisions today. This thing over time adds up. It's a critical reason why it takes two incomes in a family to do what one income could in previous generations. Obviously, taxes are a large part of it, but the debasement of the dollar since the early 70s is a critical part of it as well. And when this thing happens, when you don't have a stable currency, you end up with people not getting ahead the way they should, median incomes not growing the way they should, and leading, as my co-author Elizabeth will discuss in a few minutes, uh, a f fraying of the social fabric, reduction of social trust, and uh, more divisions. And as Keynes said, it's a process that not one in a million will be able to diagnose. And so that's why we wrote the book. Now, since monetary policy doesn't usually get the heart beating 
uh, flutter the way a, some of the reality shows do. I'll, I'll, I'll begin by just giving you an advance reward, and, and that is to give you a travel tip. If you ever find yourself in an airplane, in coach, middle seat, on the runway, watching your life pass away, and you want a little bit of elbow room to your seatmates, start talking about monetary policy. <laughs> they'll, 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 cut, they'll cut you a wide berth. So, so a, 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 as a result of the chaos that we've had, slow moving for most of the time since the 1970s, the Federal Reserve has gotten up in terms of more and more power, but the thing is, the more power it gets, the worse we are. You take quantitative easing, which I'll discuss in a moment, even though they're now tapering the thing, which is a good thing, it ended up contracting the economy rather than stimulating the economy. Now, in terms of money, the thing to understand about money, it's very basic. It makes transactions, buying and selling, which is how we prove our standard of living, which is how we exist, makes buying and selling much easier. You know, in the old days, we had barter, which was very inefficient. So let's say I sold an ad in Forbes 3,000 years ago. How would I get paid? Uh, perhaps with a herd of goats. Uh, now I'm being a little facetious here, but let's say I wanted to buy iPads for our writers. So let's say I went to the Apple store 3,000 years ago with my herd of goats. The Apple store owner says, I don't want goats, I want sheep. So I have to figure out how to swap the goats for sheep and maybe have to hire a sheep herder uh, because the uh, sheep herder, uh, you know, you don't want the wolves to eat the sheep. The sheep herder wants to be paid in wine. I have red wine, he wants white wine. I mean, it just becomes very efficient. Imagine if we still had barter today. Imagine trying to deposit a cow in an ATM. It just, just, just becomes very inefficient. So in essence, what money does, money most of the time does not have intrinsic value unless you have old gold coins and the like. But money makes transactions easier. And in that sense, money measures value. That's all it does, measures value. The way clocks measure time, scales measure weight, rulers measure length, money measures value. So because it represents value, it makes transactions easier. And in that sense, it's a form of communications. It lets you know information to do all the billions of transactions we do around the world each and every day. So money in and of itself is not wealth, but it represents a claim on products and services. Think of it as you would a coat check. A coat check has no intrinsic value. But in a restaurant, you put your coat in the closet, you get a coat check. It represents a claim on the coat. So the idea that creating money, money represents products and services that have already been produced. So it would be, if, so the idea that if we stimulate the economy by printing up money would be like a restaurant saying if we create more coat checks, that'll stimulate the production of more coats. No, it does not. It, it, it's a claim. It represents a claim on a product or service uh, money does. So money works best when it has a fixed value. You know, just like a clock has 60 minutes in an hour. Imagine what the world would be like, your daily life would be like, if the Federal Reserve did to clocks what it does to the dollar. Imagine floating the clock. So you have 60 minutes an hour one day, 48 minutes the next, 22 minutes the next, 80 the next. You'd soon have to have hedges and derivatives and futures to figure out how many hours you're working each day. Now, let's say you're baking a cake. It says, bake the batter, 45 minutes. You have to figure out, now, is that inflation-adjusted minutes, uh, real minutes? I mean, it just makes life much more difficult. Imagine what would happen if they changed the number of inches in a, in a, in a foot. You're building a bridge, and suddenly you learn that instead of uh, 12 inches, the foot's now 10 inches. Imagine building a house. It just makes things much more chaotic. So money, money works best when it has a fixed value. And then the question becomes, What's the best way to do it? And even though it's absolutely out of fashion still in the economics profession, the way it worked in this country for our first 180 years of existence is you fix it to G-O-L-D, you fix it to gold. Why gold? Because more than anything else in the world, gold keeps its intrinsic value. As for 4,000 years, you can't 
destroy it. 